Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome again to Zoology 102. This is the third lecture on Chapter 15 of your Vertebrate Diversity. Remember, Vertebrate Diversity textbook, guys. I haven't seen any copies have left the library yet. Huh? Just putting it out there. Okay, this is the third lecture on Eurocordata. Do you remember what Eurocordata meant? So these are the chordates. There's three... Oh, we'll get into it in a moment. Let me not jump ahead. Eurocordata and Cephalocordata. Okay, I'm always going to give you the page numbers that you need to be looking at your textbooks. Okay, when you guys go home, you can go through the lectures carefully. I uploaded the... Um, I uploaded the second lecture, but it took a day. It took a whole day. So I'm just trying to find a way of making them a bit smaller. Okay. So bear with me. They'll all come on um, hopefully today, but definitely this week I'll catch up. All right. So we're working with chordates, and today I want to give you a little bit of background be behind chordate classification. And very interestingly, um, this is some notes on the common ancestry of the organisms. This comes from Darwin and his, his um, classification of species, his um, discovery or the uh, theory of evolution. And what they used to consider was that there was a protostomes hypothesis that all chordates, vertebrates, evolved from some type of annelid or arthropod. Arthropods are types of insects or, or in, invertebrates, and annelids are the earthworms, hey? And they considered that the chordates came from that type of group. But that's been found to be not, not true. That was rejected. And the problem with some of this early information, again, guys, remember I told you that what we tried to do is we tried to collect information and we order these things together. We look at common characteristics and we put them in packages and we try and see whether or not these, there's, there's consistencies with their morphology. And that helps us to understand where things are, how, what things are related. And that's where the, 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 the theories behind evolution come from, because you've got some idea of, of um, what groups are very similar. And if they're similar and they share common um, traits, then something must have given them rise to that particular trait. That was the idea. But there were some issues behind looking at these structures and similarities. And there's these two terms that were always brought up, the difference between um, analog and, and analogous and homologous types of similarities. Now, the analogous similarities are where, um, yeah, let me just bring in this thing here. Historically, they used to consider that if some organism had wings and another organism has wings, then they must be related. But we've realized that that's not the case. There's no relationship between a butterfly that has wings and a bird that has wings or a bat that has wings. There's no relationship between a bat with wings and a bird with wings. Do you understand that? So you can't say that there's a direct connection because they both got wings. Um, but homologous similarities are similarities where organisms share morphological similarities that are based on a common ancestor, or at least there's consistency between them. And you can show that, that something less complex has potentially given rise to these different types of structures. And that's the theory behind um, um, homology. So all I want you to know from this is that um, from a chordate, a chordate evolution perspective, some of the early ideas what, were that they came from annelids or arthropods, and that's not, that was proven to be incorrect. And then they had issues with these two types of similarities and trying to understand wh what the ancestry would be based on these similarities. And the analogous um, similarities where you've got wings in one animal and wings in another animal, and you say, or try to show that there's a relationship, that, that's not the case. That doesn't work. Okay. So there are many organisms that have got very similar structures, but they've actually come from very different origins. That's the idea. Okay. That's the idea. All you need to learn here is what is the difference between, in the terminology, between analogy, analogy and homology. Um, you know, you guys, you guys hear a lot about homo. You know, it's even become a, a, a kitsch word for, for um, homosexual. It means same. Do you understand that? And analogy means different. That's all it is. Okay, that was wrong, so it didn't work. However, the deuterostome hypothesis has, is something that has been more widely accepted. So the deuterostome hypothesis, let me just see if it's still recording. Yep. 
suggest that um, there are some similarities between the echinoderms and the hemichordates. Now, the echinoderms are the types of um, the starfish group, okay? The starfish group. And there do seem to be some relationships between the two, but we don't have those missing links, so we don't know if that's the case. Those are just hypotheses, and you can see here that we consider them to be hypotheses that still need to be tested so that we can, um, hopefully one day we might be able to look at some more relationships, but um, that's where we are. That's supported at the moment. At the moment, And the reason for that is because the embryonic development is the same. Chordates seem to have evolved from echinoderms and hemichordates. Okay, that's the theory, and I'm going to show you a picture in, in, in a moment. Uh, morphological similarities occur between the, between the differences, and that's homologous organ, or, um, origins, okay? So re remember I just discussed the difference between homology and analogy. So homology and the differences there have got, um, sorry, let me just tell her I'm in a lecture. Uh, sorry. Um. Okay, so at least there you can show that there would have been a common ancestor because they share some of the characteristics. So that's more valid. Whenever we do a lot of these, a lot of the science to try and unpack the differences in species and their origins, we actually try and look for as much evidence, what evidence is available to us. And um, based on these evidence-based arguments, you can say, okay, this is a hypothesis, this is my theory. And those theories are out there until somebody else collects new information and says, I've got new information which suggests that your original theory was not correct or, or not perfect, and we want to adjust it somehow. That's how it works. That's why, with your textbooks, some of the new additions show that there's changes in the structuring of some of the animals. So it's even happening today. Okay, reconstruction of the early chordates have been based on protochordates. Protochordates means pre-true chordates. And these protochordates include two groups. Now remember, when we started this discussion yesterday, or last week, we showed you this picture, this, um, this simple uh, chordate classification, where we've got the chordata group, and we've got three main subphylums. You remember, this is important. The urochordata are the tailed chordates, okay? Pardon? Cephalochordata means, cephalo means head, hey? So it's chordate. Chordate, chordate with the head, and it actually means that the notochord, the cord, becomes and forms a head. Okay, so you've got cephalochordata and tailed chordata. Can you see that the tailed chordata, if you look at the organisms referring to the butt end of the animal, the tail end, and this is referring to the head end. So you've got tail end of the, of the group, you've got head end of the group, and then you've got vertebrate group, which is the middle. See, that's an easier way of remembering. Urochordata is the tail end of the group. Cephalochordata is the head end of the group, the group that's really focused on the heads and the development of the heads. And then vertebrates would kind of be in the middle. Easy way to show you how to remember it. Now, within, within, these, two, within these groups, you've got these protochordates. And this is what I want to show you here. These protochordates are the prechordates. And here you have the cephalochordata and the urochordata. Okay, these two groups. And for this week, we're going to finish looking at these groups. Okay, that's what we're going to do in lectures this week. We're going to finish up with these two groups, and then from the end of the week and next week, we're going to move on with the vertebrates. Okay, very simple. Eurochordata, cephalochordata, and then the rest, actually the rest of your semester will be focusing on the vertebrata. So can you see with these initial lectures, we want to show you sort of some of the characteristics and the features of organisms that are, have similarities. And we want to deal with these protochordates, get them done so that you know those foundational characteristics, and then we move on with the rest of the vertebrates. Then we get on to the cool stuff, like the birds and the reptiles and the mammals and the amphibians, and then the fish. Don't forget the fish. <laughs> okay. The fish part. You can, see, you can see which one I want you guys to work with, eh? There's, can you see this university is full of scientists who love these things? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We need to sit here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're going to now focus on the protochordata. So there's two subphylums. Urochordata, the tailed chordate, cephalochordata, the head 
No, it's a chord. Head chords. Okay, try and remember it that way. And those are the two groups. Okay, cool. That's what we're going to work on. First, we're going to start with the tunicates. Okay, the tunicates, so within the Eurocodata group, and there's three we're going to focus on. Three different groups. Yeah, because it looks all right. So where do you find these Eurocodata? They call them tunicates. What is a tunic? Every, anybody ever heard of the word tunic? What's a tunic? It's a, it's a jacket or something you put over you. So the tunicates, the Eurocodata, the tunicates, they've got this covering. Okay, this covering around them. That's where the word comes from. So they're marine or origin, they all occur in the sea. Yeah, it refers to this tough tunic surrounding the animal, hey? Let's see if this works. Um, tunics are non-living and they have got cellulose based. Um, the tunic of the organism is non-living, this covering, and it's cellulose in base. Adults are highly specialized and sessile. What does sessile mean? Anybody know what sessile means? That means that he glues himself to the rocks and he lives there forever. Who knows what a jellyfish is in the sea? You get this thing that looks like a jellyfish, hey? Jellyfish is this thing that moves around, hey? Maybe I'll show you a picture, we've got time later. Do you know that a jellyfish is a type of fruit from an animal that is attached to the ground? Yeah. So there's an animal that lives on the ground and produces the jellyfish. And the jellyfish is a life stage that then swims away. And then what it does is it will go and reproduce and attach itself to the bottom again and grow again. What? <laughs> I think that's a bit of a smoking call, eh? But that's what happens. Okay, the, the, the larval stage of the tunicates are tadpole, or it's called this tadpole or free swimming stage of the tunicates. So even these tunicates, similar to the, some of the jellyfish, have got this free living stage. So the adult is sessile. Sessile means he attaches himself to the rocks and he grows and he lives on the rocks and he grow, improves in size. He reproduces from the rocks and the larvae are swim away. They are free swimming. Okay, you're a, Eurocordata literally means tail chordates, refers to the shape of the notochord. Okay, the shape of the notochord, we're going to get there in a moment. Okay, this is the Eurocordata. So adults are highly specialized, tadpoles are free living. That's just showed you what they look like. You have this type of form, they call it a tadpole form because of what it looks like. Um, and it's free swimming, it can move around and move away. And then that goes through a metamorphosis into the adults. Metamorphosis like your caterpillar and your butterfly, complete change. Okay. All right, so this is what the larvae looks like. And the larvae has all the characteristics of the chordates. We're going to go through that in a moment. Okay, so what, why are they chordates? And that's why, that's what we need to look at today. It's because we're dealing with chordata, the, the, the um, subphylum chordata, we need to look at what allows them to belong to this group. Okay. All right, again, just looking at the subphylum, Eurocordata. Eurocordata meaning tailed chordates. And now within the tailed chordates, we've got three classes. Three classes. Guys, turn the heat off. I don't think that's a good idea. Please turn the aircon off. Can you just by your head, just turn the aircon off above your head? Off. That's not a good idea. It's going to make these ladies sick. Let's see if it stops. Okay, you've got three classes. You've got Asidius here, okay? And the Asidius here are the Sidians, which is what we've been looking at already. Okay, they're called sea squids. Tunicates, sea squids. Then you've got the uh, appendis, appendis, appendicularia, appendicularia. What's wrong? Can you see it? Appendicularia, and these are these guys. They're also called larvacea. Okay, we're going to go through them in a moment. So you've got three classes of Eurocordata. And then um, Thaliacea. Thaliacea are free swimming organisms like that. They look more like zooplankton. Okay, they're quite small, these guys. So before they actually were classified and grouped with the chordates, they were considered to be invertebrates and part of the, the zooplankton group. But we then discovered that they have these characteristics of chordates. And because of the characteristics, it's important for us to um, consider them. Where does this fan come from? Can you feel it blowing on you? It's not blowing on you. Maybe it's sucking. I don't know. Okay, let's start with the ascidians. 
a city of seer, the sea squirts. Hey, we looked at them already. The name is derived from the squirting water from the body during low tide to reduce body size. Okay, so they squirt all their water out, sea squirts, and then the whole size of the body collapses. It becomes quite small. And when you actually find them, guys, they've got a lot of, a lot of growth on their tunics, on their tunicates, their outer covering. So they actually look quite hard and rough. And when the tide goes out, they blow all the water out and they become very small and it tries to conceal them a little bit better. And the tunicates can actually protect them from a lot of um, solar radiation during low, low tides. Do you know what tides are in the sea? You know you get different in the sea because of the impact of the moon on the sea. When the moon is closer to the earth, it pulls the water away and it makes the sea rise. And when it, this, the earth turns around and the moon is far away from the, the earth, the sea falls again. Do you know that? So every day the sea goes up and the sea goes down. Sometimes by meters, hey? The sea can rise up and down every day by a few meters. And it actually happens twice a day because of how the earth is turning. Do you know that? So what happens is when you go to the sea, you can see the waves. But then the waves come up the beach, high tide. And then the waves slowly go down the beach, low tide. And that takes about six hours. Six hours between each tide. Every day. Every day. And when you get full moon, then you, you get the peak of that rise. It goes right up. So what happens is with these guys is they're positioned in the lower tidal zone. And during low tide, when, it's, when, the, when the moon is pulling the sea and the difference is very high, the water actually goes past them. And they're all exposed. But because they're exposed, they squirt the water out of them. You actually see a squirt, and then they sit there, and they wait for the water to come back. <coughs> okay. We call them in South Africa, we, we refer to them as red bait. Red bait. Adults are solitary, colonial, or compound life forms. They sessile, attached to rocks, pylons, ships. They can attach themselves to all sorts of things. The anatomy and feeding, we're going to go into that in a moment. The water movement is by cilia. So they actually have cilia that can actually move water with inside the organism. Okay? So what happens is you have this incurrent siphon. So the siphon can siphon water into the body, and it siphons water in through its organism and then pushes the water out. Okay, it comes in, it goes through its little, its little um, gut, its um, um, gestation, what? The, I think of the acronym for the gut, man. I can't believe today's one of those Monday mornings. But it goes through its, its intestine, you can call it that, its gut, and then it pushes it out of its anus outside of the siphon. Okay, so it circulates water through its body. Okay, do you remember when we were speaking about the characteristics of chordates, we were speaking about the different pharyngeal splits and how the pharynx can be used to draw water into the animal. This is an animal that does that. Okay, characteristics are pharynx. Remember, the pharynx is one of the characteristics of um, and where the chordate is in terms of the pharyngeal clefts. Endostyle, the endostyle is that gland that secretes mucus that allows it to absorb food out of the water. And pharyngeal slits, easy peasy. It has a stomach and it has an anus. So you can see how the water comes into the animal through its pharynx and draws it in. The endostyle secretes a mucus which takes food out of the water. And then as the flow goes through its stomach, it comes out of its anus and it squirts it out. You understand? That's how the water moves through the animal. Atrium. What is an atrium? Atrium is like a cavity. When you go and you watch a rock concert, you all sit in this giant atrium. You sit in this big area where you can all go and sit like a big cavity. And then they can project the concert. They can sing the concert to you all in an atrium. And that's why this is the idea of this cavity. And the water is squirted out through the atrium. Okay. What are these features? X current siphon, as, you, as it excretes the water outside of its siphon. Okay, looking at its circulatory system, it has a ventral heart. Okay, inside the organism actually has a heart. Can you believe it? It has very large blood vessels. Um, blood is pumped in one direction and then reserved. It has a nervous system with nerve ganglion. That's over here. And few nerves dorsal to the larynx. Reproduction is that it is a hermaphrodite. Do you know what a hermaphrodite is? In fact, the definition is here. 
It's any animal that has both male and female gonads, okay, or reproductive organs. So it can produce eggs and it can produce sperm in the same animal. But some colonies, they can actually produce sperm and they can actually release the sperm and they can mix it. So although they can produce male and female gonads, it's not very successful for you to reproduce and to interbreed on your own. So they still want to be able to release the larvae, release the, the sperm cells, release the egg cells so that they can mix. The larvae then develops and the larvae is sw free swimming and it swims away. Do you understand that? But these animals are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female sex reproduct reproductive organs in, the, in one organism. Okay. How does an animal like a flower, for example, it's a good example, make sure that they don't interbreed with itself, is that they, they ripen and the, the, the gametes are mature at different times. Then they can assure that the sperm cells from this organism will be fertilized, can be fertilized with the egg cells of another organism. But it doesn't happen inside the organism, it happens in the water. Okay. All right, and um, I suppose this is the first time you've also heard the word gametes. Gametes. Good. You know what a gamete is, hey? It's the egg or the sperm cell. Gamete can be male or female. It is the cells that are produced through meiosis. Meiosis is a type of reproduction. Gametes have half of the DNA that you, an adult has, hey? Okay, it splits it in half. And then the egg cell and the sperm cell go, go join with another organism's gametes, and then that becomes whole again. Okay. That's where the gonads and the testes occur. Okay. All right, let's look at the larvae. So larvae are elongated, tadpole-like, and transparent. Does not feed. It's only used for dispersion. Okay. So the organism can only feed when it is attached to a substrate. It becomes sessile. It develops and it metamorphosizes into an adult, and then it can start to feed. <coughs> All right. And as it grows, it grows in size. It then can grow gametes of its own, um, sexual reproductive organs of its own, and it can produce its own gametes. They can be fertilized, and then the life cycle can continue. Okay, so this is the life cycle. So you have the free swimming larvae, attachment and early metamorphosis, late metamorphosis, and you can see what's happening is that the whole structure of the body itself is changing. And you can see this notochord is starting to change, and it becomes... De degenerated. So in the adult, you don't think that you can find this. So that was what made it very difficult. In some animals, you look at the adult and you cannot see the notochord at all. But then when they do life cycle studies, they realize, oh, during its embryonic or larval phase, it has a notochord that allows the animal to swim. Do you remember the notochord allows for lateral movement? It can move from side to side, the notochord. So that's what allows the larvae to move around. Can you see all of these features and structures come together to show you how the life cycle of the organism is completed? Okay. Wait until we get to sperm cells or vertebrates, okay, and how they can swim. Okay. It's going to be very interesting. All right, so you have these nerve cord, notochord, tail with myomas. Remember the type of muscle we spoke about? It has a pharynx and a heart. And then, and that's a little picture of what it looks like during a larval stage. It really looks like a tadpole. When it, when it goes through early metamorphosis, it starts to siphon. It starts the siphon process, but it has to go through the, it has to go through metamorphosis. And that's where the pharyngeal slits are apparent. And the endostyle, the endostyle is the gland. The gland develops and starts to produce mucus, which allows it to take food out of the water, the mucus. And then it goes to late metamorphosis. You can see the notochord is degenerate. The atrium is formed, the cavity is formed, and then it allows the siphon to complete, and then you have an adult. Okay. Not bad, eh? Okay. You need to know you need to learn this, guys. I'm serious, you need to learn this. This is a very nice ten question mark, ten mark question here. Right here. You need to learn this. And I would give you I would be able to say, fill in some of the labels and explain the life cycle. Okay. Okay, so that's the end of the Ascidians. Ascidia, huh? Now we move on to 
Appendicularia. Appendicularia. Are you guys with me? No. No, it's hard. It's cold. It's cold. Yes. Please stand up and turn that aircon off, off, off. Is the aircon on? He's not even watching. Please stand up, turn the aircon off. Make sure it's off, off, off. Is it off? Okay. I think you must have may have bumped it or something. All right. Back to the Sidiusians, huh? So the Sidiusians are the C squares. You need to understand, guys. Listen to me, please. You need to understand how the the classification includes phylum and subphylum. Within the subphylum, you need to understand you have Eurocordata, Cephalocordata, Vertebrata. Within the Eurocordata, we look at the Sidians, huh? the Sidiusia. You need to be able to understand that they are C squares. You need to have some understanding of their life cycle. You need to know why they are chordates. You understand that? That could be a question. Why? Explain how Acidiaceans uh, conform to the chordate morphological requirements. What do they have? They have the characteristics. Okay? I could ask you to, to fill in the life cycle. I could give you a picture and say, fill in the labels and discuss the life cycle of Acidiaceans and how they conform to the chordate characteristics or how they include chordate characteristics. You understand that? All right, that's important. Um, let me just check quickly where I don't want to go too far if it's not if it's not necessary. Yeah, we still got quite a bit of time. All right, I'm going to move on to um, appendicularia. So the appendicularia are called larvicians. Okay. And this is what they look like. Again, they're very small little animals. Just to show you quickly, this is I found another nice photograph. Um, let me just go up and show you this photograph. Okay, there they are. This thing. Larvicine. They're beautiful. Beautiful. See, people are discovering things all the time. Like megalodons, apparently. Okay, they are small and transparent. They are free living in open ocean. So they have no sessile stage. So I could ask you, compare the differences between the um, Acidiacea and Appendicularia. And one of them would be, the one has a sessile adult stage. Okay, the other one is love, is, is free swimming throughout its whole life. Small and transparent, free swimming in, uh, free living in open ocean, resembles the larvae of the ascidians. Okay, so the larvae, the appendicularia, the larvicians, look like the larvae of the ascidians. Can you see how I'm starting to try and use the terminology? So I refer to the ascidians all the time, ascidiasia, ascidians, all the time. And I'm referring to the Eurocordata, I'm referring to the tunicates, the sea squid, the Sidiaceans. And the appendicularia are the larvaceans. And the larvaceans are very similar to the tunicates or the sea squids. Can you see? As you guys get to learn these things, you need to start to be able to communicate with them. Okay, and we don't use common names. Why? Because common names would have said vertebrates. No, that's wrong. There are not enough common names. So these guys don't even have easy common names. Some people have some names for them. Um, Larvaceans is the, is the formal term for them as well. Okay. Sometimes you have lots of animals, for example, that's just to talk about um, scientific names and common names, is that you have a formal name, which is part of its classification, like the Larvaceans, but we, we struggle with that sometimes. So we refer to these common names. But the problem with common names is that if you had many, 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 many common names for each different individual or each different organism, species, then you may as well just use the scientific terms because there's just too many. There's just too many. So I'll give you an example of the fish. Is that we showed you last week, we were catching some of these little barbs, these minnows. They look like yellowfish. Hey? How many species do you think we had last week? We had three. 
And of the three, we, and we're expecting 10 or 12. But it becomes very difficult to give them all common names. So we just call them minnows. And we group them into one common name. Okay, that's what happens. Um, it builds transparent mucus houses. And the mucus houses are there to trap organism, organ, um, food from the water. So it makes like a big net, a big mucus covering. It filters and traps tiny plankton. Okay. So it traps plankton in this mucus net, and then w within the mucus net, it absorbs all of the plankton from its mucus net, and that's how it feeds. Imagine that. Imagine creating with spit. Spit, huh? This huge balloon around you. And carrying this balloon around with you so that you hopefully can catch some floating plant matter. And when the floating <laughs> plant matter, like leaves and stuff, hits the net, you can start eating it off the mucus. That's what he does. Okay. Helps him in water. It's more common than you think. Okay. It's only one slide for the appendicularia because they're not very, well, they're not, it's, it's not as important as the cilia, say, the squirt. Has an endostyle, has the notochord, has pharyngeal slits. What else does it need? What are the characteristics <coughs> of a cord of a chordate? Post anal tail, exactly. Okay, so where's its its mouth? Can you see its mouth and its anus? It's just looking up at it. See? Mouth and its anus. And then it has a tail. Good job. Okay. Then the last of the Eurocordata group is the Thaliacea. They are also small and transparent, free living in the ocean ocean as well, barrel or lemon shaped, surrounded by a circular muscle, circular muscle bands. These guys are bioluminescent. Wow, that's pretty cool. Do you know what bioluminescence is? Anybody know what bioluminescence is? This is worth a quick this is worth a quick break to show you what bioluminescence is. Because maybe it'll help you remember. Can you try and turn the, any possibility of turning the light off there? Are the lights off there? Off, off. Sorry, can you just check if the lights are off there? Are they off? Yes. But sit still. you got to sit still. Try again. Damn, this room is terrible. Okay. Okay, turn it off. Let's see. This is what bioluminescence is. Try once more. Are they off? Yeah. Look at this. Ah, but you guys, we need to sit still. There's nothing we can do, huh? Look at this. Look at this. As this guy walks, look at what's happening to the ground. The sand. Look what happens in the water. Can you see the light? This is bioluminescence that they actually create light. The organism itself, the body of the <laughs> little animal creates light. You can see it's his hands. And we've been able to see this in Mozambique where you can swim in the water. And as the person's swimming, you can see these lights around you in the water. Amazing, hey? That's bioluminescence. My one is a lot clearer, unfortunately, than what yours looks like. Okay. Okay. And let's continue. All right. So they are bioluminescent. So thaliacea. So we've got appendicularia, thaliacea, and ascidians. Okay. They're all part of the urochordata. Okay. Tailed chordates. Then we move into the cephalochordata. Okay. 
All right, I think we can leave it there though. Okay, so I just want to go through them again. Thalia Sia, Thalia Sia is the barrel-like small translucent. They're all uricordata. Thalia Sia, Appendicularia, Appendicularia, also known as Lava Sia, because they look like the larvae of the ascidians and the ascidians themselves. The ascidians have got a, quite a complicated life, life cycle with a free swimming larval stage, a sessile adult stage. Okay, but all three of them conform to the characteristics of the chordates. Okay. Okay, so within Eurocordata, you have Acidiaceae, Appendicularia, and th uh, Thaliaceae. Okay, and that's what they look like. Again, always, please, always consider the characteristics of the chordates that they need to conform to. By the way, which of the which of the Eurocordata undertakes complete metamorphosis? I could give you that question. Which of the which of the Eurocordata group undertakes complete metamorphosis and explain it? So it's the ascidians, and the ascidians go from a larval stage into an adult stage. Adult stage is sessile, larval stage is free swimming, and you can you can explain some characteristics. If I say to you, please explain the life cycle, then you've got to refer to the reproduction as well, hey? So they've got, it's hermaphroditic, male and female sex organs in one animal, that they release the gametes, the gametes um, uh, are, uh, germinate or they, um, they develop and they become larvae, larvacea, um, no, they're not larvaceans, and then the larvae has the characteristics of the, um, of the chordates, they are free swimming, they're used for dispersal, they do not feed, they then um, attach themselves to a substrate or even ships, remember, different types of substrates. Then they go through part metamorphosis where they can start to siphon, and then they go through um, complete metamorphosis, and then they're an adult. Okay, cool, easy peasy. All right, that's the chordates. So we've explained, we've spoken about the eurocordata, eh? Hey? So you see, even the eurocordata now, <laughs> Now you can see that there's a picture of an ascidian, okay? And there's a picture of a thallus here. You see, those are the two. They don't want to put a picture here of an um, of the larvas here, of the appendicularia. And why would we not want to put a picture there? Because the appendicularia looks very similar to the cephalochordata, the lancets. You understand that? The lancets. So the only, only other prochordata, protochordata, prechordata group that we're going to look at um, this week is going to be the cephalochordates. And after the cephalochordates, we're going to start moving on to the fishes, which is the vertebrata group. Okay.